Our first witness is Dr. James Angel, uh, the Associate Professor of Finance at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business. Professor Angel specializes in the structure and regulation of financial markets around the world. His current research focuses on short selling and regulation. Dr. Angel currently serves on the Board of Directors of the Direct Edge Stock Exchange. Our next witness is Thomas Petterfee. Mr. Pettifee is chairman and CEO of the Interactive Brokers Group, a global market-making and brokerage firm with nearly $5 billion in equity capital. Its trading subsidiary is a registered broker-dealer and futures commissions merchant that provides high-speed, technology-driven trading to individual clients, hedge funds, institutional investors, and others. And another subsidiary was one of the world's first electronic market-making firms and is a registered market-maker and a liquidity provider on all major U.S. futures and securities markets. Our third witness is Marnoj Narang, the CEO of TradeWorks. During the 1990s, he held a variety of technology research and trading positions at several major Wall Street firms, gaining experience in a multitude of markets, including equities, foreign exchange, futures, and fixed income. In 1999, he left Wall Street to found TradeWorks, Inc., with the mission of democratizing the role of advanced technology in the financial markets. Our fourth witness is Mr. Kevin Cronin, Global Head of Equity Trading and Vesco LTD. He is responsible for Invesco's trading desks in Atlanta, Hong Kong, Houston, London, Melbourne, Taipei, Tokyo, and Toronto. Mr. Cronin joined Invesco in 1997 as a head of listed equity trading for Invesco AIM and later became Director of Equity Trading. Mr. Cronin is currently the Chairman of the Investment Company's Institute's Equity Markets Advisory Committee, a recently appointed member of the NASDAQ Quality of Markets Committee, and a member of the National Association of Investment Professionals and the Securities Traders Association. Thank you, Mr. Cronin. Our final witness is Steve Luparello, Vice Chairman of, financial, of the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, or FINRA, the largest non-governmental regulator for all securities firms doing business with the United States public. In this capacity, Mr. Luparello oversees FINRA's regulatory operations, including enforcement, market regulation, member regulation, and business solutions. And now, in pursuant to Rule 6 of the Rules of Procedure of the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, would you gentlemen please stand and raise your right hands. Do you swear the testimony you will give before this subcom subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Dr. Angel, your testimony, please. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I would like to thank you for the invitation. As you mentioned in the introduction, I study the nuts and bolts details of how financial markets operate around the world. And I'm also the guy who warned the SEC in writing five times in the year before the flash crash that our markets are vulnerable to these kind of events. And I'd like to say that uh, the flash crash can happen again, and here's why. First, our market is a very complex network. It consists not only of equity exchanges and futures exchanges and options exchanges, but of all the broker dealers, fixed commission merchants, IT vendors, analytics providers, media entities, investors. It is a very rich and complex ecosystem, and a disruption anywhere in that network can feed throughout the network. Now, most of the time, this market network works pretty well. That, uh, except when it doesn't. But you know, by most measurable dimensions of market quality, our market works far better, faster, and cheaper than it did 5, 10, 20 years ago. However, like any finite system, like any human system, our market has finite capacity. It can only handle so much trading activity before it chokes. And from time to time, our market is overwhelmed. Our market is overwhelmed by massive quantities of trading activity that cause the market to choke. Now, this is not a new phenomenon. You know, if you look in the history of, fina of financial markets, you'll see that going back in time, this has happened over and over again. You know, in 1906, the New York Times had a headline that blared <clears throat> the, um, let me get the words right here, uh, stocks break and then recover. You know, we saw in 1929, we saw in 1962, we saw in 1987, we see these waves of activity that overwhelm the market mechanism. So what we need is we need safeguards for this market network that are integrated across the entire market network. Now, the, uh, 
And what we need is we need somebody to be able to uh, call a timeout when the market network is going crazy, and we don't really have that right now. Now, some people grumble about market fragmentation. I think we need to worry less about the fragmentation of the market than we do about the fragmentation of regulation. We have literally hundreds of different financial regulators at the federal and state levels, and you know, they don't always play nicely with each other. A lot of stuff has fallen through the cracks, as we saw in the meltdown of 2008, and there's also a lot of duplication. So, the, um, and most of these regulators have a pretty narrow mandate that... Um, and, you know, here in Washington, we have the SEC in one granite fortress on F Street, the CFTC in another granite fortress a couple miles away in Lafayette Center. Both of them are hundreds of miles away from the financial markets they try to regulate. Uh, that lack of physical proximity makes it really hard to actually regulate the markets because it makes it much harder to figure out what's going on. And I, I think, you know, we saw in that how long it took the regulators to figure out what was going on in the flash crash is a direct result of the fragmentation of regulation and having regulators hundreds of miles away from the markets they're trying to regulate. So, our regulators need better market intelligence and they need better funding as well. Um, we've spent approximately $18 billion on the SEC since its founding in 1934. That's less than half of what investors lost from Bernie Madoff alone. So I think we've been really penny-wise and pound-foolish in the way we have funded our regulators. Now, uh, what can we do about this? Um, first of all, I, you know, I understand that there are political forces that make it really hard to consolidate agencies. But one thing we can do is we can deal with this fragmentation of regulation by putting all the financial regulatory agencies in one building. You know, instead of having them miles apart, which makes any kind of interaction difficult, we stick them in the same building. Second of all, let's stick this building in the heart of our financial district in New York. That'll make it much easier for our regulators to find out what's going on, and it'll make it easier for them to attract the kind of people with market experience they need to understand what's going on in the markets. And, you know, finally, as we pay attention to market structure, we need to think about how the markets are working for all companies, large as well as small. And I think we need to pay attention to the fact that the number of public U.S. companies has fallen by almost 50% in the last 15 years. You know, the number of public companies is shrinking steadily. And if we ran out of public companies, we ran out of jobs. That in uh, 1997, before the dot-com bubble got out of hand, there were 8,200 U.S. public companies listed on our exchanges. At the end of 2009, approximately 4,400. Now, if you figure half of the missing 4,000 companies were dot-coms that shouldn't be there or companies that were merged, well, that leaves 2,000 missing public companies. If each of them were responsible for 1,000 jobs, that's 2 million jobs lost to our public markets. That would make a big dent in our unemployment rate of 15 million. So the, uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, and I just want to say I think you should hold further hearings on the reasons why we are losing our public capital markets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Angel. Just for the, uh, uh, everyone's understanding, your records will be made, or your statements rather, will be made part of the record. So if you'd want to summarize, feel free to do that. Uh, now, uh, thank you, uh, Professor. And now, uh, Mr. Petterfry, please. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm chairman <laughs> of Interactive Brokers Group, a brokerage and market-making firm that's headquartered in Connecticut. Our customers have about $21 billion of assets with us, so we are very focused on the health of the U.S. markets. Here is my worst nightmare. Imagine a high-frequency trading firm, or HFT, with a few computers, some programmers, and 30 to 50 million in capital. These operations exist all over the world, trading with sponsored access, where an often undercapitalized U.S. broker allows the HFT to send orders directly to the exchange using the broker's membership ID. These orders are never seen by the broker before they are executed. One day at 3.45 p.m., 
the HFT starts sending waves of orders to sell large cap stocks and ETFs. As the close nears, more sellers jump in as stop orders are triggered. The market closes down 30%. The next morning, terrified investors and brokers holding under margin accounts run for the exits and sell into cascading circuit breakers. Brokers fail like dominoes. But the HFT that started it all makes a huge profit, covering its shorts at fire sale prices and moving its gains offshore before the regulators know who did it. In the alternate scenario, the market realizes that it was duped. No news is seen causing the prior race drop and the market moves up 40% the next morning. The HFT short sales are big losers, and its sponsoring broker and clearing broker go bust, possibly starting a chain reaction. Under either scenario, innocent investors will be caught by the huge down move or up move, and confidence in our markets will suffer further. This is not far-fetched. We have nothing in place to prevent this from happening. It could happen on any day. It could be a manipulator seeking profits or a disgruntled employee at a hedge fund or HFT or a brokerage firm. It could be a terrorist act or a simple computer bug. What can be done? I have four recommendations to review briefly that are explained in detail in my written testimony. These recommendations apply to the securities and futures markets because these markets are intricately linked and it is critical for the rules and surveillance tools of the two markets to be coordinated with close coordination between regulators. First, sponsored access. Rather than in July of next year, the SEC's new rules banning sponsored access should apply right away by emergency order of the Commission. Seven months is much too long to continue at risk. We screen or pat down over a million people every day to prevent a plane crash. Yet we do not screen electronic orders to prevent a market crash. The ability to send orders to exchanges should be restricted to brokers that are members of the clearinghouse. Brokers with no financial stake in the clearinghouse should not be sending unfiltered orders straight to exchanges any more than HFTs should. Second, surveillance tools. Regulators need real-time surveillance, especially the identity of the person behind each trade. The SEC should approve its proposed audit trail rules, but shorten the two-year implementation deadline. And until then, the Commission should order that clearing brokers record the identity of the person associated with each trade starting now. The CFTC should approve similar rules of the two agencies uh, as they must work together. Third, improving liquidity of the exchanges. We must improve liquidity by banning or restricting off-exchange trading of exchange-listed securities. It is bizarre that under Dodd-Frank, over-the-counter equity derivatives must trade on exchanges. Yet, exchange-listed securities can still trade over-the-counter. When exchange-listed products are traded on OTC, market makers leave and liquidity on the exchanges dries up, allowing crashes like May 6 to happen. We must address this by bringing trading in listed securities back to the exchanges. Fourth and last, circuit breakers. The current circuit breakers are in effect only from 9.45 a.m. to 3.35 p.m., but they should be in effect at all times when the market is open. Also, the circuit breakers should kick in at fixed price intervals instead of being moving targets so that every can, everyone can pre-calculate what prices are allowed and not allowed. This would eliminate the single-stock mini-crashes 
that seem to occur almost every week and that you were referring to some time ago. There, there should also be a market wide circuit breaker that, could not, that would not allow transactions to take place outside a certain limit for the day, but would allow continued trading inside those limits. Finally, the circuit breaker level must be coordinated among the stock and related derivative markets so as not to cause price misalignments that could result in temporary insolvencies. Thank you. Praying, is that correct? Sure. Thank you. Um, my name is Manoj Narang, and I'm the CEO of TradeWorks Inc. We're a financial technology firm that provides high performance trading infrastructure to investors and trading firms. In addition to supporting outside clients with our technology, we operate a proprietary trading practice which utilizes the same technology to engage in high frequency trading strategies. Our proprietary trading business consists of highly complex and data intensive algorithms based on correlations between securities that span multiple markets, including stocks, options, and futures. Before I begin, I'd like to express my gratitude for the opportunity to share my perspectives and insights in today's hearing and to recognize that smaller firms such as TradeWorks are not often accorded such a privilege. My prepared remarks are on the topic of restoring investor confidence to our markets. It is self-evident that markets depend on confidence in order to function smoothly, and there's no denying that the confidence of investors was severely shaken on May 6th. It is this loss of confidence that transformed the flash crash from just the most recent chapter of the ongoing credit crisis into the referendum on market structure that it has become. Ever since May 6th, investors have been plagued by the nagging suspicion that the regulatory agencies are powerless to understand the inner workings of the market or to meaningfully assess the practices of its most active participants. For the past two years, the public has been treated to endless debate about market structure issues. Are the prices posted by market makers fair or are they subject to widespread manipulation? What impact do rebates or elevated cancellation rates have on liquidity? Why is speed important to strategies which provide liquidity? How do the equities, options, and futures markets influence and interact with each other? The public should not be forced to accept anecdotal or speculative answers to such questions when definitive answers can be found by analyzing data. Firms like TradeWorks have the infrastructure to easily calculate objective answers to these kinds of questions. And while we happily share our insights with the SEC, what is needed to boost the market's confidence is for the market's chief regulator to have these capabilities on its own. Another key issue related to investor confidence is that the market has become too complicated for ordinary investors to understand. That's one of the things that leads to uh, speculation and uh, unsubstantiated hypotheses. Our stock market sports the most complex and fragmented structure known to mankind. The cornerstone of the system, Regulation NMS, was 10 years in the making and spans over 520 pages. For perspective, consider that in competitive games like chess, extraordinary complexity arises from just a handful of rules. It should surprise nobody that an undertaking of this magnitude might backfire, nor should it surprise anyone that such unnecessary complexity might fuel the perception among investors that the system is somehow rigged against them. Reg NMS does many things, but at its core, uh, its objective is to keep prices at the different exchanges synchronized. In most markets, this is accomplished via arbitrage, which tends to be incredibly efficient in this role. For example, consider the relationship between the stock SPY and the E-mini S&P futures contract, both of which track the S&P 500 index. Because they're completely different securities that trade on different markets, their prices are not protected by Reg NMS. But... If you sample their prices at sub-second intervals, you will find that they have a 99.9% .9 correlation to each other. I've diagrammed that correlation uh, in the exhibit. Um, you can see on the exhibit just how stable this relationship is, despite the, uh, the uh, existence of any regulation uh, to cause uh, that correlation to be that high. But apparently, a 99% correlation was not good enough to dissuade policymakers from the incredibly daunting task of crafting rules to keep prices in sync. Unfortunately, the price for complex rules that solve imaginary problems is rather high. 
Rather than minimizing fragmentation, which was his stated goal, Reg NMS has directly exacerbated it by guaranteeing that new exchanges will have orders routed to them. Rather than limiting the role of arbitrage, the regulation has diverted its focus from productive uses to the exploitation of the regulation itself. And to top it off, the rule has managed to ignite a massive technology arms race by making the speed of information transmission a more critical issue than it ever was before. Now that a heightened appetite for more rulemaking clearly exists, I feel that we're doomed to repeat our past mistakes. Once again, proposals abound to solve non-existent problems. It's easy to conjure up gimmicks such as speed limits on order cancellations, but it's also trivially easy to demonstrate how they would backfire and harm long-term investors. When lawyers with minimal trading expertise devise such rules, they should recognize that world-class engineers with a profit motive will be there to exploit them. History makes abundantly clear who tends to win this battle of wits. Many market professional, uh, professionals have strong opinions on how, to, uh, on how to fix market structure. But to win back the confidence of investors, the SEC should engage in rulemaking that is supported by empirical evidence and analysis rather than by opinions and speculation. Furthermore, adding ambitious or superfluous regulations to a system which is already hopelessly complex is guaranteed to backfire by inviting unintended consequences. Such rulemaking will not restore investor confidence in our markets. Fixing the very real flaws in our existing regulations will. I hope to have the opportunity to elaborate on these topics at today's hearing, and I ask that the entirety of my written remarks be included in the record. They will be. Thank you very much, Mr. Narang. Sure. Mr. Cronin. Thank you, Chairman Reed. Thank you, Chairman Reed and Levin, Ranking Members Bunning and Coburn, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to speak here today. I'm pleased to participate on behalf of Invesco at this hearing examining efficiency, stability, and integrity of the U.S. capital markets. Invesco is a leading independent global asset management firm with operations in 20 countries and assets under management of approximately $620 billion. In the interest of time, I will keep my comments brief, but I have submitted for the record a more detailed statement. An efficient and effective capital formation process is essential to the growth and vitality of the U.S. economy. The most important aspect of the capital formation process is that it attracts long-term investors' capital. To accomplish that, it is critically important that the primary and secondary capital markets which facilitate the capital formation process are transparent, effective, and fair. To that end, it is essential that sensible, consistent rules and regulations are in place to govern the markets and that regulators have the tools necessary to ensure the stability and integrity of those markets. Long-term investor confidence is the key to robust securities markets. To be clear, investors, both retail and institutional, are better off now than they were just a few years ago. Competition in today's market, which was virtually absent five years ago, has spurred innovation and enhanced investor access. Trading costs, certainly in the most liquid securities, has been reduced, and investors have more choice and control in how they execute their orders. With that said, over the past several years, long-term investor confidence has been challenged by a series of scandals, financial crises, economic tumult, including most recently the flash crash of May 6th. In order to recover long-term investor confidence, regulators must ensure that securities markets are highly competitive and efficient, as well as, trans as, well as transparent, and above all else, fair. While we laud the gains made in the last years, today's market structure is far from perfect. The events of May 6th brought to the forefront several inefficiencies in the current market structure and highlighted the interdependencies of equity, options, futures, and, and futures markets. Perhaps most significantly, the events of May 6 underscored the absence of an effective mechanism to dampen volatility at the single stock level. The lack of consistency and synchronization of rules which govern trading at the various exchanges, the outsized impact trading algorithms and small market orders can have in the prices of securities in times of duress, and perhaps not surprisingly, the fact that market-making mechanisms in place today provide virtually no liquidity to investors in times of market stress. Removing all instability and volatility from the equity markets is neither possible nor appropriate. However, establishing mechanisms to address extreme price moves in the markets and volatility related to inefficient market structure will be critical in promoting investor confidence in markets going forward. Many of these issues have been addressed or are in the process of being addressed by the regulators. That said, the potential for another May 6 will not entirely be removed from these actions alone. The SEC, CFTC, and SROs must be coordinated, 
diligent and measured in their efforts to create sensible regulation designed to minimize the inefficiencies of market structure and advance surveillance and enforcement capabilities to thwart nefarious behavior. There are today at least 13 for-profit exchanges. Competition between exchanges is fierce, resulting in new innovations and different ways for investors to seek and provide liquidity. This is a welcome development from our perspective, provided that the rules and regulations which govern the various exchanges are consistent and not incongruent with the goals of fairness and equal access for investors. One potential concern we have about exchange competition is that it has ignited an electronic arms race where speed, where, where speed rather, appears to be the singular objective. While Invesco believes that speed is an important variable to consider in execution of trades, we believe price is the most important variable. Buying stocks at the right price, which is determined through a robust price discovery process, is what long-term investing is all about. There is a point where speed and robust price discovery diverge, a concept that must be understood by exchanges as they race to trade in increments of one billionth of a second. There are today also 40 different trading venues, including dark pools, and over 200 broker-dealers who internalize customer order. This vast network of exchanges and venues has resulted in a very complicated web of conflicted order routing and execution practices by broker-dealer and execution venues. We believe that investors need improved information about order routing and execution practices to make better informed decisions. Today, as much as 50 to 6% of the trading activity in the U.S. equity markets is attributed to high-frequency traders, HFT. Given the recent ascendance of HFT, there's not a lot known about their practices and very, regulatory, very little regulatory oversight. Invesco believes that there are many beneficial high-frequency trading strategies and participants for provide which provide valuable liquidity and efficiencies to the market. On the other hand, we are concerned that some strategies could be considered as improper or a manipulative activity. Some of these strategies, such as the so-called order anticipation or momentum ignition strategies, provide no real liquidity to the markets or utility in any way. Rather, they prey on institutional retail orders, creating an unnecessary tax to investors. While there has been a recent case brought by regulators against this kind of improper activity, we are concerned that the ability of regulators to monitor and detect nefarious behavior by these participants is not where it needs to be. Additionally, regulators must address the increasing number of order cancellations in the securities markets. It has been theorized that as many as 95 percent of all orders entered by high-frequency traders are subsequently canceled. Order cancellations relating to making markets is one thing, but orders sent to the market with no intention of being traded is quite another, before they're canceled is quite another. These orders tax the market's technological infrastructure and under the right circumstances could overwhelm the system's capacities to process orders causing massive system failures and trading disruption. Vesco believes that efficient trading markets require many different types of investors and participants to thrive. That said, it is noteworthy that where the interests of long-term investors and short-term trading professionals diverge, the SEC has repeatedly emphasized its duty to uphold the interest of long-term investors. We need to ensure that there are no abusive practices within high-frequency trading or, from that matter, any other participant in the marketplace which contravene the interest of long-term investors. I thank you for the opportunity to speak here today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Cronin. Uh, Mr. Luparello, please. Chairman Reed, Chairman Levin, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Steve Luparello, and I serve as Vice Chairman of the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. Also known as FINRA, we are the primary independent regulator for securities brokerage firms doing business in the United States. In addition to our work overseeing firms and brokers, FINRA performs market regulation under contract for a number of market centers in the United States. Through this work, FINRA is responsible for aggregating and regulating approximately 80% of U.S. equity trading. FINRA's activities are overseen by the SEC, which approves all FINRA rules and has oversight authority over FINRA operations. Over the last several years, how and where trading occurs has evolved rapidly, as has execution speed, particularly with equity trading. High-frequency trading, dark pools, and direct access are now commonplace and have contributed to the fragmented markets that exist today. Fragmentation and increased competition have resulted in narrow quotation spreads and a high level of liquidity when markets are operating smoothly. However, it can also result in the fast electronic removal of liquidity when markets are stressed, as we all observed on May 6th.
The events of that day identified several areas where regulators could take steps to reduce the impact of extreme market volatility and provide increased transparency and predictability in restoring order to the markets following such events. FINRA has participated in these discussions with the U.S. exchangers under the leadership and direction of the SEC to establish and implement a number of important changes as described in my written statement. While the disruption of May 6th focused attention on high frequency and algorithmic trading, FINRA already has been scrutinizing trading activity to find attempts to use these technologies to implement manipulative strategies. In September, we find a New York brokerage firm, Trillium Brokerage Services, and suspended and fined several individuals at the firm for the use of an illicit high frequency trading strategy. Trillium entered numerous layered non bona fide market moving orders to generate selling and buying interest in specific stocks. By creating a false appearance of buy or sell side pressure, this strategy induced other market participants to enter orders to execute against Trillium limit orders. As a result of this improper strategy, Trillium's traders obtained advantageous prices that otherwise would not have been available to them. FINRA is able to pursue instances of this and other illegal trading strategies in the markets we regulate. However, due to the limitation of current audit trails, the risk of missing instances of manipulation, wash sales, abusive short selling, and other improper gaming strategies is still unacceptably large. With a drop in exchange barriers to entry, along with increased competition and connectivity among exchanges and other execution venues, it is clear that market quality can no longer be ensured by a single exchange acting in a siloed fashion. As the SEC correctly recognized in its recent proposal, the, this evolution of equity markets has created an environment where a consolidated audit trail is now essential to ensuring proper surveillance of and investor confidence in these markets. FINRA st strongly supports the establishment of a consolidated audit trail as a critical step to enhance regulators' ability to conduct surveillance of trading activity across multiple markets. In fact, it is very plausible that certain market participants, knowing the extent of current regulatory fragmentation, now consciously spread their trading activity across several markets in an effort to exploit this fragmentation and avoid detection. Based on our experience developing and operating the Order Audit Trail System, or OATS, FINRA believes the key aspects necessary to ensuring an effective, comprehensive, and efficient consolidated audit trail are uniform data, reliable data, and timely access to that data by the SROs and the SEC. We also believe that the most effective, efficient, and timely way to achieve the goals of a consolidated audit trail is to expand existing systems such as OATS and to consolidate exchange data with discrete new data such as large trader information into a central repository. Building off existing systems would significantly reduce both the cost and time required for implementation of a fully consolidated audit trail and integration of that audit trail into surveillance systems. Significant changes in financial markets in recent years have necessitated adaptation by regulators across a wide spectrum of issues. Both technological and policy developments have made, this practice of, have made the practice of regulating the markets a more complex task. The SEC has correctly identified one of the most pressing challenges for regulators conducting market surveillance. We are all hampered by the lack of a comprehensive, sufficiently granular, and robust consolidated audit trail across the equities markets. FINRA stands ready to work with Congress, the Commission, and our fellow SROs to help bring about a consolidated and enhanced audit trail that will facilitate more effective surveillance for the protection of investors and for market integrity. Again, thank you for the opportunity to share our views. I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your testimony. And I, I just want to recognize Senator, uh, Senator Coons has joined us. Uh, as soon as I conclude and Senator Levin conclude, we'll recognize him for questions. But I have questions for all the panelists. But let me first focus on the uh, uh, market participants. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Pettifley and uh, Narang Cronin, my presumption is that you, that you would feel that the regulators don't have all the information they, they need uh, at this time. Uh, from your perspective, what forms of information, market intelligence, et cetera, should they have? And you've listened to both Chairman Shapiro and Chairman Genser about what they're doing in terms of a consolidated audit trail. Your comments on whether that's adequate, sufficient, or addition. And just Mr. Uh, Petterfee. I agree that, that uh, they do not have all the surveillance tools that they need. However, I do not think that we should wait for the two or three or four years up until they get this consolidated audit trail for $4 billion. Mm -hmm. I think that as of tomorrow, they could order all the brokers to keep an audit trail of their own orders. And most of all, to record the name 
associated, the beneficial interest associated with each order. Then, if anything happens in the market, they could just call around and ask, who did this trade? Who did this trade? Please send it to me tomorrow. It doesn't cost anything to do that. Mm -hmm. And it can be done today. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Narang, your comments? Uh, thank you. Um, Could you turn on your microphone, please? Sorry. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, what data uh, I think the uh, regulatory bodies could benefit from. I think um, absolutely uh, I support uh, the acquisition of data that helps uh, the regulators engage in forensic analysis of various types, such as the audit trail, such as the large trader reporting requirement. And I say that as somebody who would certainly be affected by uh, at least one of those. Um, so um, that said, I think that there are some lesser known uh, items that could be uh, rather useful as well. Uh, many people have pointed to the analogy that uh, I, I think uh, one of you, in fact, uh, said earlier that the regulators are akin to uh, a moped on a highway dominated by uh, 100 mile an hour race cars. Um, the way I would uh, rephrase that in terms of data requirements is that the regulators very much need to be able to see the markets in the same way that its most active participants see it. So what that means is that they need not just direct data from the exchanges rather than the consolidated view that they see right now via the so-called SIP or the standard information processor. Um, those are consolidated feeds. The, the regulators need the direct data from the exchanges, but they need better than that. They need to be able to synchronize that data uh, in the same way that a high-frequency trader, for instance, would. Uh, and that means that they can't just rely on the timestamps uh, that the exchanges put on their data in order to synchronize them. They need to collect that data over high-speed telecommunications networks themselves and self-timestamp it. Then, furthermore, uh, you know, both uh, uh, Ms. Shapiro and Mr. Gensler uh, noted the fact that they don't have the ability to efficiently build order books from that uh, quotation data. I think that, you know, that's something that is uh, a prerequisite if you're going to have the capability to uh, police modern traders. Um, you know, technologies are out there. Uh, firms like ours possess them, for instance, uh, that allow you to very, very efficiently uh, construct uh, order books from quotation data. Now, the data uh, itself uh, is just the starting point. Um, one of the things that makes me nervous is that the SEC barely has the uh, ability, as far as I can understand, to analyze the data that it already possesses. So adding, you know, uh, 100 to 1,000 times more information to that mix is not going to really help matters if their analytical capabilities are not augmented at the same time. And the main thing that the analytical capabilities are missing, as was rightfully alluded to earlier, is the ability to analyze uh, securities based on their correlation. A tremendous amount, I would say the majority, of the volume that occurs in today's markets is premised upon the fact that securities, both within the same markets and across markets, have semi-stable correlations to each other. So that when price discovery happens in one instrument, it must propagate to other instruments that uh, are correlated to it. And regulators currently have no clue how that works and no, have no tools uh, to analyze those effects. Those effects are now structural issues, and I think that the regulators need to have analytical tools that endow, with, endow them with those capabilities. Thank you. Mr. Cronin, your comments, please, and then I'll recognize the Chairman Levin. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I would quickly add that I agree that, that having the information from a regulatory standpoint is helpful. Uh, I do tend to agree uh, that, that being able to analyze the data is fundamental. The other point that's important is that the regulators have to be able to coordinate the information seems to me that having the data, even having the, the ability to analyze, in the absence of pulling all the pieces together, isn't going to get us where we need to be. This will be an effective deterrent to the extent that it's in place. Uh, but, but as Mr. Pettifee says, I don't, I don't agree that we have the kind of time that it sounds like it's going to take. I'm not sure we have the financial appetite either, but this is something that needs to happen. Thank you. Uh, there will be a second round. Uh, let me recognize Chairman Levin. And then Thank you, Senator Reid. And uh, Mr. Petterfee, you, you uh, described your worst nightmare. 
And uh, I think uh, every member of the panel heard that uh, description of your nightmare. And I'm wondering whether or not the other members, uh, first of all, believe, as you do, that the nightmare is plausible. It definitely could happen that uh, our market is very complex and there are all kinds of things which can go wrong and Murphy's Law will strike. There will come a time when on a day of heavy trading volume, whether because of some uh, malevolent action, some benign action, or some programming error, something's going to go haywire. This is the nature of complex electronic systems. And just like sometimes our computers crash, our computerized stock network will as well. And we need to have good safeguards in place to protect us the next time it happens. Now, this wasn't uh, so much a crash based on some glitch. This was an intentional effort on the part of somebody who had as little as 30 to 50 million dollars and a few computers and a couple programmers um and so but in any event you you would agree that that nightmare scenario is plausible so yeah. let me narang uh, mr narang would you uh say do you believe it's plausible no i believe it's extraordinarily implausible and i'll explain why um i think there's no doubt that a large trader could impact the market but the attribution of that nightmare scenario to a high-frequency trader that controls only 30 to 50 million in capital is uh, utterly preposterous on its face. Um, you can do the math. Uh, you know, you can statistically estimate, as we have done, and we've shared our findings with the SEC, that, for instance, the uh, uh, trade by Waddell and Reed on May 6th, uh, the $4.1 billion trade, very likely had a price impact of around 2.7 to 2.9 percent, okay, with a reasonable degree of confidence. If you extrapolate from that what a 30 million to 50 million dollar capitalized firm could have could have done on that same day at that same time, you come up with about three basis points or three hundredths of a percent of impact. So it's entirely implausible a, a firm like that would exhaust its entire capital base before the market would would even uh, notice the movement. Okay, Mr. Cronin, do you believe that a scenario like that is plausible? Plausible, yes. Uh, 300 shares of Anadarko took it from $52 to $100,000. Okay. Mr. Luparello. Uh, I'll fall somewhere between my fellow panelists. I would say it's, it's implausible, but it's, but it's not impossible. I think there are, there are um, structures in place around risk controls in terms of the firms that provide access to the marketplace. It is not a comforting thing just to rely on risk controls of broker-dealers. I think the steps that the SEC has taken in, in the adoption of, of its rule around controlling access will go a great way to making that scenario even more implausible and, and nearly impossible. Okay, now, Mr. Petterfee, you want to comment on Mr. Narang's yes. comment? Yes. Uh, you see, with naked access, you do not need to have any capital to send in orders. You send in the orders, the orders are not even seen by the broker. You only need the money the next day when the, when the clearing broker gets these trades and he says, where is the money? Well, in this scenario, there's a lot of money there because there are embedded profits as the trader sells them down. But even if there isn't money there, it's too late the next day to discover that all this shouldn't have happened. That is why naked access is a problem. And that is why these trades should be screened. Now, let me go, let me go through your, your yeah. remedies. Yeah. Um, the, I'm over my time. You're fine. Oh, well, this may take a few minutes, so I, um, and I'm happy to come back to it. The, I'd like to go through the, the remedies, because it's whether it's plausible, implausible, but possible, or at least that much. Uh, there's a number of remedies for this that, that Mr. Petterfee has suggested. Um, and one of them has to, one of them is that the ability to submit orders to exchanges should be restricted to brokers that are clearing members. That's one of the suggestions that you make. I'm wondering if anybody wants to comment on that and also on the other uh, suggestion that relates to this, that Brokers who are not members of the clearinghouse are allowed to send orders directly to an exchange uh, with the permission or with the, uh, I guess, arrangement of a uh, clearing member broker. If they give their permission, they can 
all these 5,000 brokers that are not members of the clearinghouse can send orders directly, and you would prohibit that? Yes. Okay. So there's two, two suggestions there. Now, let me start with you. Professor Angel, you, uh, what do you think of those ideas? Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of subtleties involved with the, uh, the proposal to ban anyone but clearing members from putting orders directly into the exchange. Uh, given the economies of scale in clearing, there's been quite a consolidation in the business. So what that would do would be limit direct access only to the very largest Wall Street firms. Uh, do we really want to encourage that kind of consolidation in the industry? So that's one thing to think about. Also, I could see a clearing member actually providing naked access. And I support the SEC's proposals to get rid of so-called naked access where a broker is providing a direct pipe without screening the orders first. I think that is the most important thing here, that we have to have the right risk controls in place so that the people who are responsible for the trades know what they're sending into the markets. Even if they're doing it through a clearing broker, not being a clearing broker themselves. Right. There, there has to be, um, you, know, you need to have the risk controls in place. Okay. Now, uh, so, Mr. Narang, your comment on that suggestion. Yeah, I'd like to comment on that suggestion and also like to comment on Mr. Petterfee's refutation of my refutation. Um, so, you know what uh, that's going to produce, though. What's that? You know what the next production sure. will be of that is a refutation of your refutation of your... Correct. Happily, my time will be up perhaps before that happens. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, I fail to see the need for additional remedies. I think that uh, Mr. Petterfee's scenario, uh, by his own admission, was based on a situation where naked access or, sp or sponsored access uh, are in place. We're, we're already at the stage where a ban on sponsored access has been posted to the Federal Register and is due to go in, into effect within seven months. Would you make that effective immediately? No, I can't say that I fully... Based on an emergency argument that uh, Mr. Petterfee suggested? I, I can't say that I fully endorse the ban on sponsored access. Uh, I can see some of the rationale behind it, but I think that there are some little-known issues that are peripheral to that that uh, are anti-competitive, uh, but I think are perhaps above the scope of this hearing. As for the uh, refutation... Nothing's above the scope of this hearing. <laughs> um, if you, want to, if you want to keep us for a few hours longer, I'm happy to, happy to comment on it. Um, as far as the uh, comment about uh, the capital not needing to be there and uh, you know, risk checks not being applied, uh, that's a little bit misleading because all that naked access means is that risk checks are not done on a pre-trade basis. They're still absolutely done on a post-trade basis. And there's not much latency uh, between uh, the time a trade occurs and the time... That was the next morning comment. No, it's not. No, by post trade does not mean next morning. Post trade means as soon as the trade happens, your buying power is reduced. Okay. okay. Do you agree with that? Brokerage firms monitor your day trading buying power. No, no, I do not. The fact is that there are many little brokers who provide naked access. There is nobody policing whether they do any screening of orders or not. So some of them, I assume, do post trade screening. Many of them probably do not. Okay, I interrupted you, Mr. Nuri. I don't know of any who do not. Um, I think that is a rather hypothetical statement. Um, so the point is that post-trade risk checks are uh, nearly universal and uh, you know, adequately pre uh, prevent people from uh, exceeding their, their buying power. Okay. Very quickly then, Mr. Kronig, because I'm way over my time. I'm, I'm just amused listening to the whole thing. Uh, like all long-term investors, you know, we get hung up uh, in listening to some of this discussion and kind of scratch our heads and say, you know what, guys, when we're talking about naked access and that kind of thing, we're kind of losing sight of what the goal of, of the structure and the integrity of markets is. Uh, there have to be rules in place to prevent nefarious activity. If, if we think there's a chance that shutting the door today can contain that, I think we should shut the door today and move on. There are more important things for the world to worry about than the naked and, naked and unfiltered access. Thank you. Mr. Luperello? Uh, I would have to say that Mr. Petterfee's um, scenario is based on an assumption 
that a clearing firm is not managing intraday risk. So the idea then that only clearing firms should be allowed to trade in that context would be, would be I think, an, an odd solution. I don't want to say that, that every clearing firm is perfect at managing intraday risk, but it is their economic livelihood is, is staked on it. Again, I would go back to the, the recent rulemaking by the Commission, which puts some real teeth in what that monitoring means. But as a general matter, clearing firms monitor intraday risk because it's what keeps them open day after day. And would you make that rule immediately effective? I, I, I don't. I would assume that there is a fair amount of disruption that would go with that. And, and on the, the rare scenario that a clearing firm was mismanaging its intraday risk, to have that much dislocation in that shorter period of time, I would worry that the costs would outweigh the benefits. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Levin. Uh, we uh, have been joined by Senator Coons, who is the worthy successor to Senator Ted Kaufman, who is one of the, I think, great, uh, I think the right word would be, uh, and persistent uh, analyst of the whole issue of high fiction trading's impact on markets. And thank you, Senator Coons, for joining us. And made a major contribution. Major contribution. To the bill. I know Senator Reed was right in the middle of that uh, famous Dodd Frank bill. Would agree, but also uh, for the permanent subcommittee, was it a, just an extraordinary contributor to our efforts? So, and we know that you're you're right in that uh, capability as well. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Reed and, and Chairman Levin. I, I hope to be uh, Senator Kaufman's successor in interest, uh, both in subject matter interest and in uh, interest in terms of representing uh, both the people of Delaware and our country. Uh, Senator Kaufman did a great deal of work, I think, uh, to ensure the stability, the transparency, the fairness and liquidity of our markets following uh, one of the greatest uh, market dislocations uh, we've known. Uh, I'll uh, report back to him that I had the opportunity uh, to hear one of the first cases of refutation arbitrage that I think I've ever uh, seen uh, in testimony. Um, and I just wanted to focus uh, on, on a sort of simple question, I think. Uh, markets fundamental role in our economy, in my view, is uh, capital formation and um, serving and protecting long-term investors. Uh, and that's sort of part of the purpose of the transparency, fairness, and stability. So uh, my question first to you, Mr. Cronin, if I might, uh, to what degree are you concerned that the markets are no longer serving those functions uh, and that high-frequency trading is um, detracting uh, from price discovery in a way that undermines those core goals of our markets? As I said, uh, Senator, the, the, the overall function of the market is much better for investors today than it was, say, five years ago. Mm. Competition has been enhanced. Our ability to have more control of our orders has clearly been enhanced. And we have seen a reduction in transaction cost. Now, I will say that that has not been a universal experience. Transaction cost reduction clearly in the top 200 names, I think, uh, given the ubiquitous liquidity that's available now, uh, is clear. When we move down the market cap curve, it's not as clear that this market structure is serving the smaller companies uh, in, in the formation process as well as it could otherwise. Uh, so, so I am confident that market structure is better today. It can always be better. It will always probably be the case that it could be better. Uh, to the extent that high-frequency trading has entered the, the market, I mean, frankly, we're fairly agnostic. To the extent that the activity adds liquidity... Uh, and, and doesn't cause uh, undue dislocation on, on a given day or week, uh, we're okay. But the problem is that we don't believe that the regulators have the appropriate tools to really understand all the things that go on. Uh, we're pretty smart, and we understand a lot that goes on, and, and I'm sure that there are areas that we can't possibly understand today. So what does concern me is I think there are nefarious activities and participants who are out there who today are taking advantage of investors. That's wrong. If you bring nothing to the party in terms of liquidity uh, or, you know, efficiencies, you shouldn't tax investors. There's no purpose for that. Hmm. So we have some concerns about high frequency, but we would have concerns about any participant who's trying to manipulate the market. So we so, wouldn't single them out necessarily. So then just two follow-up questions I might ask all the members of the panel in my time left to, to comment on both of these. There's some propose there's a, an IPO crisis. Um, that in part is um, a consequence or an outcome of these short-term strategies. So what linkage do you see uh, between all the dynamics of market fragmentation and the difficulties um, identified here, particularly in the market sectors that maybe you don't participate in but others? Uh, and what's the impact uh, of that on innovation and capital formation for IPOs? And then just a follow-on question, should high-frequency traders who, who act like market makers be subject to additional regulations that would help solve that specific problem, if you would, please, Professor. 
Uh, thank you, Senator. I'm very glad you're uh, cognizant of the IPO crisis because I think it has serious implications for our long-term growth and stability of our economy. Um, I do not think that high-frequency trading as such is at the root of it. You know, there are many other things in our economy, ranging from Sarbanes-Oxley 404, the litigation environment, and other market structure changes that we can talk about uh, if you have a few more hours. The thing about high-frequency trading is that there's both good and bad computerized trading. All investors these days are using computers basically to do what they used to do manually. You know, and a lot of this is good for the market. You know, for example, a lot of so-called high-frequency traders follow the old strategy of buy on the dip, sell on the rebound. That helps to stabilize prices. And one of the things that happened on May 6th was when the data feeds got scrambled and those people were said, we can't trust our data feeds, those people who were stabilizing the market stepped aside and other traders kept on going, causing the market mechanism to fail. So some high-frequency traders are really good. Others help keep prices in line with each other. If uh, you know, Coke gets out of line with Pepsi, they step in to make sure that those prices stay in sort of the same correlated path. So a lot of what they do is good. I won't say everything they do is good, but we can't just say, ooh, high-frequency trading is bad. It's, you know, there are some strategies that may be harmful to the market, but the bulk of them are actually doing things that help the market. However, I do think we need to pay attention to the smaller cap side of the market because what we've done is we've collapsed transaction costs. We have a one-size-fits-all market mentality at the SEC, and I'm convinced that smaller companies actually need a different market mechanism and that having a market mechanism with a very small bid-ask spread for those companies is not necessarily the best market mechanism. And I think we really need to pay a lot of attention to how small companies come to market and how, the, how hospitable the market is to them, because that's where our future growth lies, and that's where we have a serious crisis on our hands. Thank you. Uh, I am over time, so if, if any other members of the panel who want to comment could keep it just on that one yeah. question, I'd appreciate it. Take your time. Um, High-frequency traders uh, are not by themselves good or bad. When they provide liquidity, they are good. When they take liquidity, they are not so good. I think this would be very simple to regulate, namely, when a high-frequency trader provides liquidity, namely, it puts in a bid or an offer that uh, um, doesn't take out any other bid or offer, then that's a useful activity, and therefore they sh should be encouraged to do so. They could be even be incentivized to become market makers because that's what market makers do. And when they are taking liquidity, which is basically a, a, a way of, of probably front-running statistical relationships that will come back in line, then they should, uh, and their order should be slowed by, I suggested, a tenth of a second. Um, sorry. Um, I, I'd like to comment about your uh, question earlier about the capital formation process and more generally about the social utility of high-frequency trading because many people have raised uh, that issue. Um, I'd like to point out that when an investor buys shares of a company in the open market, the proceeds of that purchase uh, go to the seller. They do not go to the company uh, that the stock is written on. Uh, no capital is raised from the firm, for the firm in question when an investor purchases shares of that security. In other words, no capital formation happens in the secondary market. The capital formation is the job of the primary market. The role of the secondary market is exclusively to encourage investors to participate in the primary market by providing them with liquidity. Hmm. Okay? So when you're planning uh, the desirable attributes for a secondary market to have, I firmly believe that, little, uh, that there are few, if any, attributes that can trump liquidity. That is the overriding social purpose of a secondary market. It's to support the capital raising function that occurs in the primary market. So to the extent that you believe that high frequency trading is a fixture of our markets in terms of liquidity provision, then you would have to argue that it serves just as much, if not more, of a social value than, the, than investing in, in company shares in the secondary market does. Um, second of all, on the notion of obligations, uh, my... Uh, major concern there is that obligations really put us on a slippery slope towards the two-tier market of, that we had in the 90s. I think our goal, uh, uh, or your goal as policymakers, 
ought to be to keep the good features of the market that have occurred uh, as, as the markets have evolved, uh, have evolved and, you know, address or ameliorate the bad ones. Uh, I don't think that, you know, in terms of the bad features, we're, we're talking about mostly unbridled fragmentation. Um, in terms of the good features, I don't think that uh, anyone disputes the fact that markets have gotten more liquid uh, and that spreads have gotten tighter and transactions costs have gone down. And virtually no one disputes the, the, the notion that that has happened because the market-making function has been opened up, to, opened up to competition. The two-tiered system that we had was dismantled. Going back to that system uh, would be counterproductive. Further, furthermore, uh, I can't think of any uh, empirical evidence that market maker obligations actually matter in practice. Take the example of May 6th. On May 6th, there is a corner of our industry known as the uh, uh, wholesaling industry, which executes the bulk of all retail order flow. Uh, virtually every firm in that industry shut down for business during the flash crash and dumped its shares onto the market. That is the one corner of our industry that does have obligations. Okay, so it shows you how effective obligations are. And in 1987, during the, uh, during the great crash in October, Black Monday, uh, market makers took a lot of heat for many, many months in the press after that event for, quote unquote, putting their hands down and refusing to take orders. So the point is that even if you're obligated 99.9% .9 of the time to provide liquidity, the 0.1% of the time where, you're, where, where you'll choose not to is precisely at those moments where the market needs it most. So obligations, there's no empirical evidence that such a thing will work. There is empirical evidence that uh, people who request obligations uh, will also request certain privileges uh, that go along with them. Well put. Thank you. Well, that's a question with a lot of different dimensions. I think that I'll try to condense my thoughts to this. There is always confusion of volume and liquidity in the market. There is, a, without doubt, much more liquidity in, in the top 200 names than there's been, uh, certainly historically. But I'm not sure that another 100 million shares trading in Citigroup qualifies as real liquidity in the marketplace. In fact, I don't think it qualifies at all. Hmm. So I do think, that, again, if we were to look at the market in terms of all of the different components of the market, there was clearly the top part, which has been functioning and serviced very well by the current structure. It's very much less clear in terms of transaction cost, and believe me, we've done the analysis, that the market structure currently is serving the other parts of, of the market very well. Uh, so I, I think if, if there were value in market making, and I think historically market making has been an important part of the efficient market structure, then it's certainly worthy of consideration. I get that nobody wants to catch falling knives. No question about it. We've seen it time and again. However, we are putting in place circuit breakers. We are putting in place some other things that I think could be helpful in those calamitous events that make the provision of liquidity, albeit probably on the small end, um, it, at least at some level more orderly and fair than it's been historically, and, and, and maybe there's some value in that going forward. Thank you. Mr. Lupero. It was multi-part, and it's been multi-part responses, so I'll just uh, I'll, I'll align myself with, with the last bit that um, Mr. Cronin said. I, I do think there's a place for mandatory liquidity in the marketplace. I, I think Mr. Narang is right that, that that mandatory liquidity has not stepped in the way of moving trains, but, but, but Kevin is also correct that those trains with certain circuit breakers can only move so far. So as, as policymakers continue to analyze the place of high-frequency traders in the marketplace and analyze that trade-off of, of, in theory, liquidity and volatility, I think one of the aspects that have to be looked at in there is how productive is that liquidity and how can you put some mandatory obligations back on certain participants in the marketplace. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much to the panel. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, and let me just start the second round briefly, and then I'll turn it over to Chairman Levin to uh, conclude the hearing. But uh, it, it uh, strikes me that one of the, I think, consistent themes of all the panel has been that high-frequency trading is, has provided some efficiencies to the marketplace, has utilities to the marketplace, et cetera. But there are high-frequency trading strategies that are dangerous and uh, disruptive and harmful to investors. And the other point I think that emerges is that at this juncture, the regulators don't have the ability to understand, even with all the data, these different strategies, and that their focus should be on the, uh, let's say, the uh, 
unfortunate strategies or the perverse strategies with a term, analogy. And I'm just, Mr. Rang, Mr. Cron, quickly, is, is that a fair summary of, of, of where you think we are? Uh, first of all, let me say that uh, I certainly agree that there exist uh, high-frequency strategies that uh, perhaps have less social utility than others. Uh, I don't know of any high-frequency strategies that are in use uh, or that it could even be uh, hypothetically conceived of that are destabilizing to the, to the market system in some way. And the reason I say that is simply uh, a recognition of the fact that uh, virtually every high-frequency trading firm that's out there controls very, very little capital. Mm -hmm. The largest high-frequency trading firms in the world would not even be medium-sized hedge funds uh, in terms of the capital they mm -hmm. control. So the point is it takes capital to move markets. Markets move because of buying pressure or selling pressure. The buying pressure or selling pressure in any fixed unit of time uh, that's sufficiently long is uh, roughly equal for a high-frequency trading firm. That's what makes them have high frequency. The high frequency refers to their holding period. So if your holding period is only one minute, what that means is that in a minute, on average, you buy and sell the same number of shares. You cannot have a protracted or uh, permanent effect on a stock's price when you do that. So that virtually rules out the possibility of destabilization, barring uh, some hitherto unknown uh, accidental bug that occurs. But I think, we're, I think your uh, question focused more on intentionality. Um, so from an intentionality perspective, uh, I would say that yes, uh, high-frequency strategies like any other strategies run the gamut in terms of what value they provide. But I don't know that markets should be policed based on uh, uh, some sort of subjective assessment of, about how much value a participant is adding to the market. I think that all that should happen is that rules should be obeyed that, uh, that, that, you know, make sure that there's a level playing field and that uh, uh, the markets are, uh, are fair. And uh, what I will tell you is that even though I am a high-frequency trader, there are definitely unfair aspects of the market structure today that uh, favor uh, certain participants over others. Well, thank you. Uh, for, first, I think you've illustrated uh, there, are two, there are at least two issues at play here. Stability of the markets and fairness of the markets. Yes. The markets could be very stable, but very unfair to participants, some participants, and, and, and grossly overcompensating others. But I think it's a poor point. But Mr. Cronin, Mr. Uh, Pitifree, you're just quick comments, and I want to... So I, I would submit there is one other dimension other than buy and sell, right. and that is, quote, right. why are there participants allegedly quoting in one stock 4,000 times in a second? What's the intention there? So I, I, I do believe that there is activity that goes on that is trying to get institutional or retail orders to react without, in fact, taking the risk of taking an offering or hitting a bid. I think that's, that's out there and, and certainly needs to be looked at. Uh, Mr. Pettifree, please, quickly. Uh, the risk of systemic disaster caused by uh, trade, uh, disruptive trades is, is, is very real. Uh, there is no justification for continuing naked access. We should stop it now. It costs nothing to stop it. Only irresponsible, undercapitalized brokers support naked access, and there is no justification for continuing it. Thank you. Uh, if I may just say, I have never heard of Mr. Nereng before, and as far as I know, his reputation is impeccable. <laughs> well... Thank you very I much. Second, I yeah. second that thought. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Does that have to reflect on the record? Yeah. <laughs> One of the interesting things about this hearing is it's raised more questions than it's answered, and that's, that's a good hearing in my book, because this is a very extraordinarily complicated topic, and you've all shed so much light on it. There's a one other issue here, and, and that is, and uh, Mr. Narek made the point that, uh, you know, primary markets form capital. Professor Angel made the point that the primary market, the IPOs, seem to be diminishing, the public companies are diminishing, et cetera. Uh, and in this, so is there a, a contradiction between this very successful, if you will, secondary market, highly liquid, et cetera, but the fact that it's not generating the kind of capital formation that puts people to work, i.e., the classic, which, which always I didn't understand, I probably still do, the real economy versus the financial economy. And we talk about high-frequency trading and naked, you know, that's, 
the financial, the real economy is do I have a job, do I have capital to expand my business, et cetera. So I, if you can just comment briefly on that, Professor Angel. Sure. We have, uh, I, I call it the best of times and the worst of times, just like in Charles Dickens. Um, you know, for the most liquid stocks, the big stocks, it really is the best of times. By you know, almost any measurable dimension of market quality, you know, the market from Microsoft, IBM, Citigroup is very liquid, very cheap, very fast. It works really well. But when you get into the smaller stocks, you have liquidity drying up. I mean, it's better than it was 10 years ago, but still, a lot of smaller companies just say, hey, it's not worth it to access the capital markets, whether because it's the high cost of being a public company with all the compliance requirements or the fact that the capital market isn't recognizing the value of these enterprises. Now, we need good secondary markets to provide exits for the people who buy in the primary market. But we also need the, uh, you know, the IPO market to provide exits for the entrepreneurs who build the companies. And we really need to pay a lot of attention to what's going wrong here. There's no one magic bullet here, but it is a serious crisis. Well, uh, Mr. Rang, very quickly. I uh, appreciate it. Um, I think that the uh, committee would be well served to solicit the testimony of uh, venture capitalists on this topic. And I'm confident that what they would tell you is that the main reason why uh, companies are not seeking to go the IPO route is because the stock market has been roughly flat for the past 10 years. And uh, a better exit for companies is to sell their firm to Google, Google or uh, some other big public company than to list themselves. So in other words, economic conditions clearly have a lot more to do uh, with the state of affairs when it comes to listing companies than uh, you know, the health of the secondary market. Um, the second thing I would say is that it's also uh, been shown, I believe, that uh, uh, other exchanges across the world are perhaps more competitive uh, than the United States. Uh, because of regulations such as Sarbanes-Oxley and other regulations that uh, you have to comply with if you're, if you're listed in the United States. So that's another uh, thing I think that ought to be studied. Thank you all very much for your excellent testimony and participation. Chairman Levin, thank you. Okay, thank you again, Senator Reid, for all you've done in this area. And um, for today's hearing, too, uh, doing this jointly with you and your staff has been uh, very, very... Uh, Useful, I know to us, and uh, I hope uh, also to uh, the Senate and its considerations. Um, I have some additional questions which I am going to be asking of you, and uh, so let me start, uh, I guess, with Mr. Luparello, um, um, and then going down the line here. I, I think most of you, if not all of you, have said that that the um, trading across multiple market venues um, has made it. Um, necessary for the regulators to have information from those same venues in order to effectively regulate or to police uh, potentially manipulative trading. They just can't look at uh, activity on their own trading pra uh, platform. First of all, do you agree with that? Uh, 100%. Does, does anyone disagree with that? Okay, so I'll, I'll shorten that then. Um, now, when it comes to the manipulative trading that exists in the view of some, I think many, that exists between platforms, um, including phony bids and layering strategies or other strategies, um, let me, I think, start now with you, Mr. Cronin. Um, have you observed what appeared to be manipulative, um, same-day trading between platforms? I have not directly. Um, anecdotally, I certainly have heard about different things, uh, but, but not really so much across platforms. So for example, if you're talking about the futures exchange relative to the underlying, uh, I have not. Okay. But you've heard anecdotally about such... Yes. Okay. Mr. Narang. Um, look, there's little doubt that that stuff happens. Um, uh, you know, I was a treasury market maker in the mid-90s, uh, making markets on, on long bonds for a primary dealer. And uh, it was very common in those days for traders to, quote-unquote, paint the screens. In other words, to show buying interest 
uh, on the screens when in fact they were sellers. Okay, uh, that's not a new practice and it really has nothing to do with computers or automation. In fact, I would uh, hasten to add that uh, those sorts of strategies uh, really are the domain of human beings because they can't be modeled, uh, they can't be simulated. You can't model the, the effect of what would happen if you show a large quote. Okay, uh, and that's why, you know, everyone, I was a little bit disturbed when the Trillium example, uh, uh, which everyone points to, uh, occurred and it was immediately blamed on high frequency traders. Um, Trillium was a firm, as far as I understand, that uh, consisted of human day traders. And the fact that they held their positions on an intraday basis should not uh, immediately paint everybody who does that uh, with a bad brush. Um, the point is that these sorts of strategies are psychological in nature, and humans have no uh, computers have no capacity uh, to run those sorts of things. That's on a theoretical level. On a practical level, um, one of the benefits to the market of computers, computerized trading that's not discussed very much is the fact that it leaves a very, very uh, concrete paper trail. Um, so uh, the forensic analysis is uh, readily doable when uh, algorithmic traders uh, uh, are participating in the market. So because of that, uh, you, you know, uh, computerized algorithms uh, have a very concrete recipe that's written down. It's discoverable. It can be subpoenaed. Uh, so it would be remarkably foolish for somebody who's intending to engage in manipulative activity to do that with an algorithm. Uh, that's something that's best done by human beings, and for all practical purposes, I know of no example uh, that's been discovered thus far of manipulative activity uh, being done by computer. Well, no, putting aside how it's done, that wasn't part of my question. Sure. And my question was whether or not... I have no doubt that it's done, but I don't know of any concrete examples. Okay. So you have not observed manipulative same-day trading between platforms? No, but I would virtually guarantee that it occurs. Okay. Mr. Mr. Petterfee. Uh, we, we see that happening all, all the time, but uh, I, I do not believe that that should be such a great concern. I mean, it, it, it is bad, but we have much, much worse situations to deal with at this time. Okay. Uh, but I'm suggesting here that uh, each broker keep on record the identity of a person associated with each order. So if there is any order that is questionable, it can be very easily uh, collected by the regulators from the different exchanges and uh, correlate the order submitter by name. Let me, let me call Professor Angel before I go back to that point. Do you, you have a, a comment on my last question about whether or not uh, you you believe that this that manipulative same day trading between platforms exists. Well, there are two types of manipulation. There's the old fashioned manipulation, like order ignition, where you dump a big sell order in the market, trying to push the price down to scare other people and trigger all the stop orders. The uh, that doesn't really depend on the platform, and indeed, a lot of traders don't pay any attention to the platform. The, uh, you know, they just send an order to someone like Mr. Petterfee and his very good smart router figures out where to get best execution for that order. So the, um, you know, there's a lot of trading, a lot of good trading and a lot of manipulative trading that doesn't really pay attention to the platforms. The, um, now, is somebody actually you know, trying to say, OK, I'm going to put this order into this exchange versus that exchange because nobody will notice? Um, the regulators but, don't have such automatic access. Well, actually, the uh, Intermarket Surveillance Group feed actually does consolidate you know, the data. So if somebody's trading, the, you know, the folks over at uh, FINRA can very quickly, through an electronic blue sheet, figure out who did what. Now, they just can't put together the order books to figure out the strategies, and that's why they need better data. And that's why it takes an awful lot of time to put together these studies, doesn't it, or these analyses? <laughs> that is certainly one of the reasons. So, but, but another reason is, is that the quality of data we get for the purposes of running surveillance 
is is fragmented and incomplete, and and that prevents us from looking at activity across markets. And that's what I want to ask you about next: is that fragmented and incomplete information? Uh, what is not included in the information? I guess is the beneficial owner or the person putting the order in. Is it, that correct? It, it is a variety of things. At this point, you still have the equities markets being regulated somewhat in siloed fashions. We're in the process of aggregating our current regulation of the over-the-counter market and NASDAQ and adding in the New York Stock Exchange regulated markets, which give us a very, will give us a, a much closer to complete picture of the equities trading. But options markets are still done in a siloed fashion, and options and equities obviously are still done in that way. So consolidated auto trail, I think, is the necessary step to getting to a, an ability to look at these things happening across market on a real-time basis. And are broker-dealers required to report the executing broker or the customer information? Uh, at this point, executing broker, but not customer information. At this so, point. At this point. So that level is of... Is that it, useful? Uh, customer information is certainly useful, um, I think, especially if you're looking at it not from maybe necessarily every customer, but certainly at the, the large trader thresholds that the SEC has proposed. It is certainly a very useful bit of information. And is, that for in the work, is that in the works? Uh, well, I think I, uh, Chairman Shapiro alluded to, um, to, to developments in the consolidated auto trail that, that I'm, I can't speak to, but... But one would hope that anything that came out of Consolidated Auto Trail was not just the merger of the data at the executing level, but the, but the inclusion of some level of more granular customer data. And what about the stock exchanges? You don't look at them, right? No, no, we do. Um, we, and you get that, that same information from them? I, yes. It, it, the way it currently works and the way it would work in, in a Consolidated Auto Trail is the merger of, of the data, not just at the executing level, but also the exchange order books, and that's absolutely essential. And that's where the customer is all, to get the name of the customer would be useful as well? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Anyone want to comment on that? Can I just add on the, on the customer information? Yeah. While we completely support the idea of having the information in the regulator's hands, obviously that's very sensitive and privileged information. Uh, that if there was any leakage of could have very bad consequence to our clients and shareholders. So we would just make sure that while this data is being collected and, and for the right purposes, that it is secure uh, and that we don't read about WikiLeaks or anything else with, with our positions because that would be catastrophic to our clients. Okay. But subject to that, you would agree with Mr. Luparello that yes. in order the regulators got to have access to that information? Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Luperello, is FINRA currently investigating activities involving foreign-owned accounts that are held at U.S. broker-dealers located in other countries? Uh, our jurisdictional limitations make that difficult, and it is an area that we're quite concerned about. Um, broker-dealers obviously have customers, some based in the U.S., some based, based abroad. In addition, sometimes those customers are just a... a I don't want to say a cover, but, but something that sits above a network of, of other customers. Since our jurisdiction only goes to the broker-dealer and our ability to compel that first level of information, investigations that we have get stopped at that level, and if there's an ongoing concern of illegal conduct, that'll result in a referral to the SEC. All right, so but you, you basically have difficulty investigating foreign accounts that you, suspe that you uh, suspect of trading abuses well, well, our the reasons you give, and among also because you can't get clients' names. Yes. Well, well, we can get clients' names in the course of an investigation. So if we are doing an investigation, we will ask the firm for client names. They will provide that to us. Our ability to compel either uh, either financial information or testimony from customers is is what limits us, and and so that's true whether they're domestic customers or international customers. Obviously, the ability of the SEC then to reach those international customers creates yet another layer of complexity. Okay, just... Yeah. And the same uh, point about uh, foreign banks, Mr. Luperello. Is it true that Foreign banks that open accounts with U.S. broker-dealers are not required to disclose the names of their customers to U.S. broker-dealers. 
U.S. broker dealers have an obligation to to know their customer. That comes out in a variety of different other requirements, including, but most importantly, probably anti money laundering. What what exact requirements those U.S. broker dealers have to know not just the customer but the customer of the customer is an area that has been somewhat vague over the years. I think, again, to point to, I would point to what the Commission has put forward in terms of its rulemaking that is mostly around sponsored and naked access but could potentially be used to add some greater teeth to those know your customer requirements because there is that concern that actually the customer of the broker dealer is is just a, a holding entity for the real customers sitting behind that. Uh, that construct actually exists in the U.S. too, and and in some master sub account scenarios that we try to look through to have the customer of the customer be treated as a customer of the broker dealer. I think there's both further interpretive rulemaking and, and enforcement that needs to be done in that area. Mr. Narang, you made reference to certain unfair aspects that exist to some participants. Can you? expand on what those unfair aspects are? Uh, yes, they're, they're a little bit esoteric, uh, but I'll do my best. Um, basically, in, in the United States equity markets, uh, uh, the vast majority of exchanges observe what is known as price time priority. That means that orders that arrive uh, at the exchange at a particular price uh, get uh, first priority uh, to, arrive, uh, to, to execute against uh, inbound orders uh, based on their arrival time. Um, if your order arrives before mine, then uh, somebody who wants to trade at that price uh, actively will uh, give you a fill uh, before they give me a fill. Now, because of some technicalities associated with Reg NMS, uh, particularly in Rule 611, the so-called order protection rule, um, the... Uh, uh, the long-term investors who, uh, you know, are, are attempting to trade and form a new price um, in the process uh, very often lose their priority to uh, certain proprietary trading firms that have the ability to utilize uh, a specialized kind of order known as intermarket sweep orders. And so what happens is that uh, price time priority gets violated. Now, you can empirically calculate what price time priority is worth. It's worth a lot of money. So there is a massive transfer of wealth underway from uh, long-term investors uh, who are executing via VWAP algorithms or, or uh, just old-fashioned techniques to, into the pockets of uh, certain high-frequency traders who uh, actively utilize that capability. Um, I don't think that those high-frequency trading firms should be faulted for us utilizing that capability because there's no intentionality behind that. Uh, what happens is that uh, when a long-term investor goes to uh, take an offer and post a bid at the new price, the exchange will hold up that bid uh, until the price is formed by somebody who uh, is using an ISO order. So the user of the ISO order doesn't need to know why it's happening. They just need to know that there's a two-cent spread now and they want to tighten the spread. So uh, the uh, high-frequency trader who's doing that is acting in the interests of the market as well as his own interests but that is not a fair proposition. Uh, that is one of the few uh, unfair aspects of market structure that I know about. The other is the tiering of rebates. Uh, the exchanges tend to give uh, much higher liquidity rebates, not all of them. Uh, the BATS exchange is a notable exception. But uh, many other exchanges give higher rebates, liquidity rebates, to their most active traders than they do to smaller traders. Um, and I think that's an anti-competitive practice and ought to be seriously examined. Um, by and large, I don't want to give the impression that the equities market is unfair. I think that this is one of the fairest markets in the world and one of the most well-functioning. That doesn't mean it's perfect. Uh, the glitch in Rule 611 that I mentioned to you is this very same glitch that's responsible for all the market fragmentation that we've seen. Uh, this very same rule uh, is what causes exchanges to route orders to other exchanges rather than posting them uh, if they appear to lock uh, the exchange's notion of the uh, national best bidder offer. That creates an economic incentive for new exchanges to spring up that never existed before Reg NMS went into effect uh, because they have the ability to virtually be guaranteed to get order flow for, uh, from, from other exchanges. Uh, that's why uh, the, market, uh, the market centers have proliferated to the extent that they have since Reg NMS went into effect in 2007. 
Thank you. Just uh, one last question of uh, Mr. Luparello. Uh, our first panel was asked a question uh, by me about, uh, and I believe you were here during that question, about what, ha what appeared to be an attempted short squeeze by Goldman traders using credit default swaps that bet against mortgage-backed securities. Now, if a, w I think you were here during that. I was. If a FINRA member were to attempt a short squeeze but were, was unsuccessful, in it, this, what to me is a intended manipulation. Would FINRA typically investigate this activity to determine whether it violated FINRA rules, such as the FINRA rules rule about quote high standards of commercial honor and just and equitable principles of trade? Close quote. Absolutely. I, I, that that scenario, and and I was not privy to the facts be, before this, and. I think there's probably a question about whether those were securities at the time, but that fact pattern in, in the current environment and attempted a, a, trading practices that had a specific manipulative intent behind them, irrespective of the success or failure of that, would be something that would be investigated and we would think could, with the right facts, run afoul of our rules. Anybody want to add anything before we uh, bring our hearing to a close? Okay. Yeah. There's no I would I would just like to thank the chairman for uh, investigating these very important issues. I was uh, very impressed by the eloquence and uh, uh, basically high quality of your opening speech, and I just want to urge you to keep up the good work. Well, I'm glad we gave you that opportunity to say that. Uh, <laughs> anybody else want to know? I better I better stop while I'm ahead. Um, thank you all, and we have good uh, number of letters from. Uh, two exchanges, which we will make part of the record. Uh, there may be some questions that we'd like to ask each of you for the record that may come to you. And uh, you're not obligated to answer them, but we sure would appreciate them, your answers. Uh, and uh, we will stand adjourned again with our thanks to each of you, uh, not just for your testimony and your direct uh, um, answers, but also for uh, very graciously being allowed to uh, be uh, moved about to satisfy a very uh, crazy Senate schedule. I won't say it's unusual. Crazy as usual. But thank you. <laughs>